morning everyone my topic for today's presentation is parietal lobe its function tests and role in psychiatry this is an overview of all of the topics we will be going through today first we'll talk about the anatomy of parietal lobe then the functions of parietal lobe the lesions of parietal lobe and finally its role in psychiatry now the parietal lobe it lies behind the central sulcus and is bounded below by the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus and by the second imaginary line and behind by the upper part of the first imaginary line as is seen in this diagram now the post central sulcus will run downward and forward parallel to and a little behind the central sulcus the area between these two sulci is the post central gyrus the rest of the parietal lobe is divided into a superior parietal lobe and an inferior parietal lobe by the intra parietal sulcus the part that arches over the upturned posterior end of the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus is called a supra marginal gyrus and the part that arches over the superior temporal sulcus is called as the angular gyrus now as we can see that this is the post central sulcus this is the central sulcus and the area between them is the pre central sulcus this is the supra marginal gyrus and uh, this uh, the part above it is the inferior parietal lobe uh, the intra parietal sulcus divides uh, the parietal lobe into the inferior parietal lobe and the superior parietal lobe <laughs> Now these are the broadman's areas in the parietal lobe. First, on the supralateral surface, we have the primary somatosensory area, which are area three, one, two of broadman, and are supplied by the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. And uh, next, we have the somatosensory association area, which are broadman number five and seven, and this is also supplied by the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. then we have the secondary somatosensory area and part of vulcus uh, sensory speech area which is broadman number 39 and 40 and is uh, supplied by the middle cerebral artery on the medial surface of the parietal lobe we again have the primary somatosensory area which are area 312 of broadman and is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and the precuneus which uh, contains uh, the somatosensory association area which is area number 7 of broadman and is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery in this diagram we can see uh, the primary somatosensory area this is the somatosensory association area and this is the vernicase area and on the medial surface this is the primary somatosensory area and this is the somatosensory association area. In the primary somatosensory area, that is area three, one, and two of Brodmann, uh, this is response. This is the sensory area, and in this area, the responses can be recorded uh, when individual parts of the body are, are uh, stimulated. Now, like the motor area, the body representation here also is upside down, that is inverted homunculus. Uh, the area of cortex that receives sensations from a particular part of the body. is not proportional to the size of that part but rather to the complexity of sensations which are received from it. hence the digits the lips and the tongue have a disproportionately larger representation lesion of this area will cause contralateral sensory loss the somatosensory association area that is area 5 and 7 it helps us uh, in recognizing size shape and texture of objects and its lesion will cause stereognosis or tactile agnosia now stereognosis is the inability to identify object by feel only in the absence of an input from the visual system now the lesions of the parietal lobe i know it can be divided into the lesions of post central gyrus the lesions of mesial aspect and the lateral aspect lesions the lesion of post central gyrus will cause somatosensory disturbances which um, may uh, which will 
which will present as contralateral sensory nodes. First uh, will be object uh, recognition, then position sense, touch, pain and temperature, then vibration, and also cause tactile extinction. It may also cause contralateral pain and paresthesias. Uh, lesions of the mesial aspect of cuneus will cause transcortical sensory aphasia if the lesion is in the dominant hemisphere and they cause attentional disorder. The lateral aspect lesion, that is the lesion of the superior and inferior parietal lobe, it can again be divided into the dominant hemisphere lesion or the non-dominant hemisphere lesion. Lesions of the dominant hemisphere because parietal apraxia, finger agnosia, acalculia, right left disorientation, literal alexia, and conduction aphasia. <clears throat> and those of the non dominant hemisphere will cause uh, anosognosia, autotopagnosia, spatial disorientation, hemispatial neglect or sensory inattention, constructional apraxia, dressing apraxia. Loss of topographical memory, anesthesia, uh, hemisometognosia, and asynthesia for pain. Now, first we'll talk about the elemental somatosensory disturbances. Now, this is caused by lesions of the post central ganglia, and it will cause. <clears throat> Next, we'll talk about the Wernicke's aphasia. <laughs> now, the sensory speech area of Wernicke lies on the posterior part, superior and middle temporal gyri of the language dominant hemisphere, and also extends into areas 39 and 40 of the parietal lobe. Now, the patient with Wernicke's aphasia will have a fluent, effortless, well articulated speech, but the output will contain many paraphasias and will be devoid of substantive words. Now, the essential feature of Wernicke's aphasia is a severe disturbance of auditory comprehension. Now, because the comprehension effect is so marked, the patient will answer questions inappropriately and will also be completely unaware that the answers are often totally nonsense. Repetition is severely impaired because of a severe auditory processing defect. Naming is grossly paraphasic, and reading and writing are also markedly impaired. The lesion which will cause Wernicke's aphasia is in the posterior language area. Now, if single word comprehension is good, but comprehension of complex material and written language is impaired, the lesion is more likely to involve the parietal lobe rather than the superior temporal. <laughs> Next, we'll talk about the conduction aphasia. The hallmark of conduction aphasia is a disproportionate deficit in repetition. This syndrome is characterized by fluent, yet halting, speech with word finding pauses and literal paraphrases. Comprehension is good, naming is mildly disturbed, and repetition is severely defect. Now, in conduction aphasia, reading is quite good, but writing shows errors in spelling, word choice, and syntax. <laughs> now, these are the tests for aphasia. Now, first, we'll 
uh, we'll check the role of fluency of the patient. In this, we have two tests. We have the animal naming test and we have the FAS test. Now, in the animal naming test, we ask the patient to recall and name as many animals as possible in a time span of around 60 seconds. Now, we will record the number of correct responses the patient will give and also if he if there are any paraphrasias given by the patient. Now, a normal patient can uh, tell about 18 to 22 animals, uh, plus minus 5 to 7, uh, <clears throat> in a time span of around uh, 60 seconds. If the score is less than 30, in a patient of less than 70 years of age, we will call it impaired verbal fluency. Now, uh, this test, it, uh, we also have to check the age of the patient, as normal age-related decline is also there. Next, we have the FAS test. Now, in this, there are three separate timed words. Uh, word naming trials are there. Uh, we uh, ask the patient to name as many uh, words as possible with the letters F, A, and S in, again, a time span of around 60 seconds. A normal patient will be able to tell about 56 to 60 words. And again, if the number of words given by the patient are less than 10, it will be decreased verbal fluency. Next, we'll talk. Uh, next, we'll check the comprehension of the patient. In this, we have uh, two tests. We can choose pointing commands, or we can ask the patient questions, which can be answered with a yes or no response. Now, in uh, pointing commands, we can uh, we ask the, we point to single objects in the room, and we ask patients to identify them. If the patient is able to do that, then we ask the patient to again point to objects with an increasing number of sequences. Like we ask the patient to point to the wall, the window, and rooms on, uh, in, uh, in a sequence. And we increase the number of objects till the patient finally fails. <clears throat> Next, we talk about the questions which can be answered with uh, a yes or no response. Um, <clears throat> we just ask the patient if the uh, like we um, like if there is uh, a table in this room and the patient will say yes or he can say no. Then we have repetition. <clears throat> now repetition is also done in ascending order of difficulty. First, ask the patient to uh, to repeat single monosyllabic words. If he is able to do that, we increase uh, the order of difficulty and we finally reach to complex sentences. Like each fight, uh, they did the boxer for championship bout. This is a very complex sentence. And simple monos uh, monosyllabic words will be like ball or airplane. <clears throat> Next, we have naming and word finding. Now in this, we can use the confrontation naming test. In this, uh, we uh, can show the patient pictures of a variety of objects or pictures of objects. And we ask the patient to name them. At least in that picture, 10 to 20 objects should be there, which the patient can name. Next, we have is reading. <laughs> now, reading, uh, first, uh, before uh, we ask the patient uh, to read, we should know about the educational background of the patient. Uh, now, we, in this test, we check the comprehension of the patient and the reading aloud ability of the patient. So we ask the patient to read aloud, read aloud first words, then phrases, then sentences, then paragraphs. Then we ask the patient to the names of objects in the room. And finally, uh, we ask the patient questions which can be answered as yes or no. <clears throat> then we talk about attentional dyslexia. Now, attentional dyslexia may also occur as a form of simultaneousia, where single words are read normally, but several words together will be incorrectly read. Now, these patients may also identify single letters, but not letters and words. Now, reading may show literal migration errors, in which a letter from one word is substituted at the same place in an adjacent way. Like long turn becomes tongue turn or long learn. Now, this impairment will also occur with left temporal, temporal occipital junction as well as left right junctions. <clears throat> Let me talk about hemineglate. A significant unilateral neglect is rather unknown. 
but may be seen as a chronic effect of parietal lesions, predominantly in the non-dominant hemisphere. Clinically, the spectrum of denial and neglect syndrome ranges from explicit denial of illness as a more severe behavioral abnormality to a mild inability to recognize stimulation on one side of the body during bilateral simultaneous stimulation, that is, inflammation or extinction. Some patients do not demonstrate prior denial, but do have a dramatic neglect of one side of the body. They may shave only one side of the face, use only one sleeve of their own, and fail to use one side of the body, even though paralysis is not present. Now, these patients may also neglect one half of the extra personal environment, even in the absence of a visual field. And then we talked about agraphia. With the exception of patients with pure word deafness, all patients with aphasia show some degree of agraphidose. Now, there are two syndromes which are seen in patients with uh, damage to the dominant parietal limb. First is agraphia with alexia and a syndrome of agraphia in association with other parietal loop signs, that is dyscalculia, right left disorientation, and finger agnosia, which is called as Jerson syndrome. Now, parietal agraphia will be characterized by impairment in the drawing of letters, relative preservation of the syntactic structure of sentences, and parallel impairment of all writing modalities, that is spontaneous writing, writing to dictation, and copying. By contrast, in aphasic agraphia, <coughs> copying ability is usually preserved. Now, uh, agraphia will be diagnosed when a patient demonstrates basic language errors of raw spelling errors or use of paragraphias, that is word or syllable substitutions. Now, when we have to test writing, we first have the patient write letters and numbers to dictation. Then we ask the patient to write names of common objects or body parts. And third, if patient can successfully write single words, we ask them to write a short sentence describing the weather, their job, or picture from a magazine. Now, in Alexia, <clears throat> the inferior parietal lobe in the dominant hemisphere, that is primarily area 39, which is the angular guidance, is the association cortex that combines the visual and auditory information which is necessary for reading and writing. In Alexia, without a graphy, the inferior parietal lobe is disconnected from all visual input. And one of the dramatic aspects of this syndrome is the patient's ability to write lengthy, meaningful messages only to be unable to read his or her writing. These patients are, however, able to understand words which are spelled aloud. A second distinct type of alexia, which is classically called alexia with agraphia, it will result from damage to the inferior parietal lobe itself, that is the angular damage. Now, this lesion will render the patient unable to read or write. And these patients are not appreciably aphasic, but may have a certain degree of amount. Now we talk about uh, apraxias. Uh, first is the parietal apraxia. Now apraxia has been defined as a disorder of skilled movement that is not caused by weakness, sensory loss, abnormality of tone or posture, abnormal movements, intellectual deterioration, or poor comprehension. Now, this deficit may interfere with the patient's ability to use tools such as dinnerware. In addition, patients have also difficulty in performing a pantomime, such as to make believe that they are lighting a cigarette or combing their hair. Now, this type of apraxia, which has been termed ideomotor apraxia, it will appear with dominant parietal lesions or lesions of the premotor area of the frontal nerve, that is, area 6 and 8 of Broadway. <coughs> Next is the dressing apraxia. <clears throat> now, this syndrome of dressing apraxia, it will tend to, write, to arise in association with spatial deficits following right hemisphere damage. The resulting difficulty in coordinating the spatial and tactual demands of dressing can be seen in patients' difficulty in identifying the top or bottom of a garment, as well as right left confusion in inserting his or her limbs into the garment. Now, dressing time can be painfully protracted, and the patient may actually present with a greater level of functional dependence that might otherwise be expected from assessment of simple motor or spatial skills. Now, the tests of ideal motor apraxia 
first are the doctor patient commands. Now, in all of these commands, we will first ask the patient to mind uh, that uh, mime our command. If the patient is unable to do that, we will first perform this action and then we'll ask the patient to imitate. If the patient will fail again, then we will provide that actual object and again ask the patient to follow, follow that thing. Because when we provide that actual object, it will uh, it provides an additional visual and proprioceptive uh, comprehension to the patient. So like in Bakpo patient commands, we will command the patient, like show me how to blow out a match. Now, <clears throat> now the patient may have a difficulty in giving a short congruent exhalation or um, difficulty maintaining appropriate mouth posture for the same. Or we can ask the patient that protrude your tongue and the patient will show an inability to stick out tongue. Tongue will be moving in mouth, but it will tend to push against front, front teeth and will not do Now then we'll... Uh, no, no. Then limb commands, like we can ask the patient to uh, show me how to see you. Uh, now the patient may, may have his hand over head uh, or hand waving may be there. And other commands can be like use a toothbrush, flip a coin, hammer a nail, comb your hair, snap your fingers, kick a ball and crush out the city. Next, we also ask the patient uh, to do whole body commands. Like, show me how to stand like a boxer, swing a baseball bat, and bow for a man or curtsy for a woman. <clears throat> Next, we'll talk about right to left disorientation. Now, for this uh, test, there are um, four points. In first, we ask the first, we check the patient's identification on self. So, we uh, command the patient, like, show me your right foot. Or show me your left hand. Then we check the, uh, then we do cross commands on self. Like we ask the patient that with your right hand, you touch your left shoulder. Or with your left hand, touch your right hand. Then uh, there will be identification on examiner with examiner facing the patient. Like point to my left knee, or point to my right elbow. Then cross commands on examiner, again with the examiner facing the patient. That with your right hand, point to my left eye. And with your left hand, to my left. Now for checking finger agnosia, again there are three points. First will be non-verbal finger recognition. Now we'll uh, ask the patient to keep his eyes closed and we'll touch one of his fingers. Then, the, uh, then we'll ask the patient to open his eyes and he should point to the same finger on our hand, that is the examiner's. Then uh, we will check the identification of main finger on examiner's hand. Now the examiner's hand should be placed in various positions. That is palm down on the table facing the patient. Or the hand should be held vertically in the air with the palm facing the patient. Or the hand held horizontally in the air with the palm facing the examiner. So the examiner should say like point to my main finger, point to my ring finger and like. Then will be verbal identification or naming of fingers on self and exam. Now the patient and examiner's hands in this should be placed in the various positions as we have described before. And the examiner should point to the patient's index finger and say, what is the name of this finger? Or point to the uh, ring finger and say, what is the name of this finger? Now we talk about e calculia. Now for I don't know e calculia is characterized by the loss of ability to understand the meaning of numbers and numeric concepts. That is if the numbers are larger or they are small. And by the inability to align numbers correctly on the page owing to visual spatial deficits. Now, the malalignment in complex computations can often be the most striking feature in this calculator, which is seen in patients with right to life, right to now the loss of topographical memory in this the visual or tactile localization of points in space and judgment of direction and distance are now patients with right to right and visions they tend to misplace the cities on the map and to get lost in familiar surroundings and the last this last type of topographic dis disorientation is more common in bilateral to right <clears throat> now we talk about anesthesia now, when stimulated on the side, contralateral to the hemisphere uh, lesion, which is especially brightened, the patients may demonstrate anesthesia. 
Now in this, they misplace the location, the stimulus which we have given as coming from the normal side. And you know, like most commonly, patients with anesthesia incorrectly identify that left side is stimuli is coming from the right side. Now, uh, hemisomatoglossia. Patients with variety lesions may demonstrate hemisomatoglossia, which is a unilateral misperception for one's own body. Now, uh, now, this may be conscious that the patient may feel like a hemiapathy, or it may be unconscious. That is, the uh, patient will behave as if he is in uh, hemiapathy. Now, constructional apraxia. Now, constructional ability or constructional practices for visual constructive ability. This is the ability to draw or construct two or three dimensional figures or shapes. Now, a disturbance in praxis or apraxia, this refers only to a breakdown in the execution of the learned movements that are involved in the construction task. Now, this uh, occurs in variety of regions as they are the principal cortical areas which are involved in visual motor integration. Now, the test for epraxia first is the reproduction drawings. Now, uh, these uh, diagrams they are given in increasing order of difficulty. The examiner may use standard pre drawn test to, set of designs. He may draw his uh, diagram bedside and ask the patient to reproduce them. Now, a scoring is done for this 0 is poor, 1 is fair, 2 is good, and 3 is excellent. Next, we have the drawings to command. Now, um, now this we ask the patient to like draw a clock with, uh, and we tell the patient time, that is draw a clock with a certain number of time. Or we ask the patient to draw a daisy in platform or a house in perspective so that the, we can see two sides and a roof. Now we have class, we have the block design test. Now in this four multicolor tubes, uh, four multicolor cubes are taken and we have four stimulus designs. Now these designs are again in increasing order of difficulty. We ask the patient that take these cubes and draw the same design. <coughs> Next we have the asymmetria for pain. Now, patients with dominant parietal, especially supramarginal iris or bilateral parietal lesions, may demonstrate a symphoria for pain in which the patient may, dis may not, does not react appropriately to pain and may indeed smile during painful stimuli. Now, we talk about the parietal lobe role in uh, psychiatric diseases. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease is characterized pathologically by the degeneration of neurons and the replacement by senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Clinical pathological studies have suggested that the cognitive decline is best correlated with the loss of synapses. And initially, the parietal and temporal lobes are affected in this with relative sparing of the frontal lobes. Now, in uh, ADHD, the researchers that have hypothesized networks within the brain for promoting components of attention, including focusing, sustaining attention, and shifting attention. Now, they describe neuroanatomical correlations with the superior and temporal cortices with focusing attention and external parietal and cortical striation regions with motor executive functions. Now, the hippocampus is associated with encoding of memory traces and the prefrontal cortex with shifting from one stimulus to another. Now, in alpha withdrawal patients, on a positron emission tomography study of blood flow during alcohol withdrawal in an otherwise healthy person with alcohol dependence. It reported a globally zero rate of metabolic activity. And with further inspection of the data, the authors they concluded that the activity is especially low in left to right and right frontal areas. Now, in schizophrenia, an MRI NIMH study of more than 100 children with childhood onset schizophrenia and the typically developing siblings. Now, this study was uh, for about two decades. It documented that progressive gray matter loss occurs continuously over time. Now, this gray matter shrinkage, it occurs with ventricular increase, with the pattern of loss originating in the parietal region and proceeding frontally to dorsal, lateral, prefrontal, and temporal cortices, including superior temporal gyre. 
Now, hence this provided evidence that early loss of parietal gray matter followed by frontal and parietal gray matter loss is more pronounced in childhood onset schizophrenia than in uh, schizophrenia with later onset. Now, in Gulf War syndrome, in the Persian Gulf War against Iraq, uh, which began in 1990 and it ended in 1991, approximately uh, 7 lakh American soldiers served in the Coalition forces. And upon their return, more than 1 lakh US veterans, they reported a vast array of health problems, including irritability, chronic fatigue, shortness of breath, muscle and joint pain, migraine headaches, digestive disturbances, rash, hair loss, forgetfulness and difficulty concentrating. Collectively, these symptoms were called as Gulf War syndrome. The US Department of Defense, it acknowledged that up to 20,000 troops who served in the combat area, they may have been exposed to chemical weapons. And the best evidence indicates that the condition which occurred is uh, may have been precipitated by exposure to an unidentified toxin. Now, on a uh, study, the loss of memory or on study of loss of memory which occurred in this syndrome, it found structural changes in the right parietal lobe and damage to the basal ganglia with associated neurotransmitter dysfunction. The uh, repetition process they are the occupation to uh, repeat things with in increasing audible frequency. We will start with single monosyllabic words like ball or airplane. Now this will finally uh, like difficulty will increase. First we say a single monosyllable word. Then we will say like repeat two words and three words. And finally we will come to a very complex sentence. Like for example, like each fight read the boxing for championship bout. Each fight redded the boxer for championship bout. This is a very complex sentence. So, elasticity. I 
So this will be how you do the So Are you asking to look at the yeah. 
इसमें पीपल भी सब कर लिए सिर्फ 
I think it's a good, very good presentation. Thank you.